the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter twelve. We're going to read the uh, entire chapter. It's not a, a real lengthy chapter. There's 17 verses, and uh, there's a lot here, and I'm not going to deal with a lot of what's written here this, this morning, but uh, it is a good study. And even in studying for the message this morning, even looking at some things I won't deal with, that it was a blessing to my heart, and I would encourage you to read it and to study it as well. We are thankful to see each of you here this morning. We're thankful for the visitors we have. We have several visiting with us, and uh, it just brings great joy to us that you've chosen to come this way this morning. I knew we would have several families out. I knew several were traveling, and uh, that's always a little bit uh, discouraging, even if you know where they are, because you miss them. And uh, I think one thing that attracts people to these mega churches today is the fact that uh, they can slip in and slip out. And, uh, nobody ever knows whether they're there or not, but when you're in a small church, that uh, it, it, ma it certainly matters. It matters with the Lord. When you're in a small church, it certainly matters because uh, when, when one or two or three or four families are out, it makes a big difference. And uh, so we're glad that you're here. We certainly uh, pray these others that are gone could we'll, uh, come, be able to come back safely and be back with us. Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read the text beginning in verse 1, and like I said, we'll read down. And through the end of the chapter. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, there, there's a lot of different opinions and thoughts concerning even the symbolism that's here in this chapter. And yet, that uh, I'm, I'm satisfied that what you see in verse 1 is, is a symbolic of the nation of Israel. You can go back in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 37, and as, jo as Joseph would have his dreams, his father was identified as the sun, his mother as the moon, and, and brothers as the eleven stars. And so I feel like that that's certainly what we see here. And uh, he goes on in verse 2, And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns, Upon his head. Now, all of these horns and crowns, they also uh, are symbolic of different things. And again, I'm not going to take time to deal with a lot of that this morning because there's a specific thought I want to try to get across. However, we know that this is Satan because we, we find that, that he's identified in verse 9 as this great dragon. Verse 4 And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to, de to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now I believe that's speaking of Jesus Christ, that he certainly came forth. He was born of a woman born under the law. He certainly came uh, from the line of, of Jacob through his... Uh, son uh, Judah, and you see here that uh, that he came forth. He was born into this world, and uh, it says that he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. We know that's future, and uh, it, there's a colon there, and uh, what you see in that colon between that colon and the word and, you've got about thirty three and a half years of the life of Jesus Christ. That's not. Uh, it's not specified here. Of course, that's not what uh, John is, is dealing with. He's dealing with this vision that he sees. It says in verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now, I believe this is future. This is speaking of the nation of Israel during the tribulation period, specifically the second half of the tribulation period. The woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And that would be the three and a half years. Again, the second half of the tribulation period was uh, ordinarily referred to as the great tribulation period. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. You don't think about there being war in heaven. You think of heaven as a place of peace. And there it is following this. But we read here that there's war in heaven. Michael, who's the archangel, and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now who is the woman again? It's the nation of Israel. And so as he's cast down to the earth, it says that he would, uh, he would uh, see he has just a short time and that he would persecute the nation of Israel. You know, I'm going to finish reading here in just a minute. It's always been Satan's desire to destroy Christ. It's always been his desire to, reach, to come to a place of prominence even above God. And that's what caused him, that was his great sin. And uh, certainly caused him to lose his place as, as Lucifer. And uh, that you, you'll find, and you can even go and you can read even the prophets there in the Old Testament concerning even the great, uh, the, the, the great attempt of Satan uh, during the tribulation period to totally annihilate the nation of Israel. There's, there's times in the Bible it got close. I can, I can think of one account in the Old Testament where it got down to where there was just one descendant left. And uh, I guess everybody thought he, was, he had been killed. And that there was a woman that took him and, and was a nurse unto him. And for several years that she hid him there, even right under uh, the, the queen's eye. She didn't know it. And, uh, of course, that was all in God's plan. You can think about during the Holocaust how that Hitler... Basically, a third of the Jews were killed uh, during that period of time. And uh, certainly that was driven by this dragon, by Satan. And we'll read, you, you can study in the scriptures during the Great Tribulation period, two-thirds of the nation of Israel will be killed. And yet there'll be a remnant. But he goes on and he makes this statement. And to the woman, verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. I heard some say that's talking about airplanes. I don't know that's necessarily talking about airplanes. But nevertheless, God's going to protect the nation of Israel. It said that she was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Again, you look at that being three and a half times or three and a half years from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a, as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth, swallowed, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now let's read on down through this entire chapter. And I know I stopped to make some comments concerning this. And as I said earlier, it's a good study. And no doubt something that you could spend just a lot of time dealing with and I want to go back and I'm going to take our thought just out of a few verses here but before I do that I'm going to make some statements this morning I ordinarily just don't make statements such as this but it's on my heart this morning and uh, I believe it's safe to say that probably all of us this week that we've observed at least some of the things that's going on in our nation's capital uh, I don't watch a lot of television I probably watch more television this week than I've watched in a long time uh, just b because of the gravity of the situation uh, that we're, we're looking at. And uh, I think that most of us could sort of understand uh, what's going on there and the circumstances surrounding it. And I think we'd all have an opinion concerning that. And uh, I have an opinion, and I will not share that with you this morning from the pulpit. I don't believe the pulpit is the place to do that. If you want to talk to me in private, I'd share some things with you, but I'll not do that up here. My place is to, is to bring you the, the, the Word of God. And if, if I fail to do that, if I get into politics and things that don't belong here, then I'm certainly going to have to answer to the Lord for that. But I do want to take a moment to speak to our young people. And I want, I want, to, uh, I want you to listen very, very carefully. And uh, You may not know what all is going on up there, and I'm not going into just great detail, will you? Suffice it to say this. That there's a man 53 years old, and uh, this man that uh, he's had a very successful career in law, 
Uh, he graduated, I guess, from Harvard or Yale. I have to go back and look. But graduated from one of the prestigious uh, law uh, schools in the Northeast. Uh, he has served in cabinets of presidents. Uh, he uh, has had a, been appointed to a federal judgeship on a very powerful court in our land. Uh, he's a man. He's, he's married. He's got two young daughters. I guess his children would be pretty close to the age of my children. I don't know exactly what their ages are. Uh, but as I said, he's been nominated to fill a vacancy on the United States Supreme Court. And I guess for a lawyer, I don't really know what makes a lawyer tick. I know they like to hear themselves talk. Uh, by the way, most of the uh, politicians that we have, if you've, if you've watched the Senate hearings this week, a lot of those senators have law degrees. And you understand very quickly that they like to talk and that they like to make themselves known. Uh, nevertheless, that uh, this man has been accused of inappropriate sexual behavior. Uh, I guess when he was a junior, senior in high school, and uh, that's been, if, if my, my math's right, about 36 years ago uh, for him. And uh, we know this, and I, I'm, I don't want you, I'm not getting into politics now, I'm just trying to make a point. I think we all understand that anybody can make an accusation against anybody else. There's none of us that are immune from being accused of anything. Uh, Brother Allen mentioned our Sunday school class, and I thought about it a lot this week. We can go back in, in, in the book of Genesis that we read about a man named Joseph, a man that was a very upright man, a man that you couldn't find any fault with. You weren't going to pin, any, you weren't going to pin anything down upon him. And yet that, uh, there was a woman that accused him of doing something that he did not do. In fact, he was doing everything in his power to get away uh, from her. And so that, that I've just simply said that to say this, that we can be accused uh, of anything. The Bible, Jesus even taught in the book of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount that if we'd be accused of things falsely for his name's sake, he said that, that we'd be blessed because of that. And again, I'm not making any sort of comparisons to what's going on there. Just trying to prove a point. Now, you young people, I want you to listen to me. That uh, this man with, a, with an impeccable record, years and years and years of, of uh, working in, in, the, in, in, in public, working in a very professional uh, career, uh, with, with many individuals that have testified to the fact that he's been nothing but... Uh, but fair and he's been nothing but of the utmost morality in dealing with them in the business world and yet that you find that uh, he's got this accusation that's been brought against him and there were two things that I as, as he made his statements the other day there were two things that just jumped out at me and this is what on my heart to share with you for just a minute you young people as he began to talk about his past I found at least two mistakes that he made as a young person whether he's guilty, I'm, I'm not, this is no reflection upon whether he's guilty or not. I said, I'm not going to deal with that this morning. But when, as he began to talk about his youth, he talked about two things. And one is the choice of those that were in his social circle. <laughs> We've been studying on Wednesday night about how, how important it is that you choose the right friends and companions. Because a lot of times that those friends and companions, they influence you in a positive or a negative manner. And I'm not saying all of those were negative influences upon him. But I feel like that he could have chosen better people to associate with. And the second thing that, that he mentioned was the fact that alcohol was a part of his upbringing. And he was not shy about that. And uh, I understand that the religion that he, uh, he associates with, that they don't see, the day, they, don't sit, they don't teach what we teach concerning alcohol. But I find in the Word of God that, Pro, that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And so I can think about that, that whatever happens with this, and I don't know what's going to happen with it, but whatever happens with it, I wonder if he ever goes back and regrets making those choices. Of the choices to partake in these things, of the, of the choices to, to, to choose that social circle in which that he walked. And after all of these years of, of, of having just an impeccable record, 
And yet that uh, now that he is, is facing some of these things, I just wonder, no matter what the motivation is behind all this, I just wonder would things have been different if he'd have made some better choices as a young person? You young people, the choices that you make now are going are gonna to go with you the rest of your life. And I want to say this to you, before, and then we're going to move on into the, the thought that's on my heart uh, this morning, that your good name ought to be something of great value to you. Your good name ought to be something that with everything that's within you, that you strive to maintain that good name. And I tell you what, you know what's kept me a lot of times, maybe from, from getting into trouble? And I, I never was one to seek out trouble. I tried to pick good friends, and it's, it's not that I ever came to the precipice of it, and this kept me from getting into it. But I tell you, way back yonder, maybe in, in, in making decisions that could have eventually led to things I shouldn't have got into, one of the things that kept me a lot of times from that, Brother Allen, was just simply the fact that I did not want to disappoint my parents. And I did not want to disappoint my Heavenly Father. And I did not want to do anything that would ruin their name or to ruin uh, their reputation. I thought about Timothy, that when Paul went there to Lystra, he found a man with, of a good reputation. He found a man there that was one that was well reported of by his brethren. And so Paul wrote to him that you, in, in writing to him in, in the epistle, he said that Timothy, he encouraged him to be an example of the believers. And he mentioned several things in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Let me sum it up like this, young people. Don't do anything anybody could ever come back on you later in life and accuse you. Whether it's true or whether it's false, the truth will come out. But you live your life above reproach. You live your life in such a manner that those sorts of things that won't even be able to be uh, pinned upon you. Now, let's get back to the scriptures that we read here in Revelation chapter 12. I want to go back to verse 7 and take our thought this morning uh, out of just a few verses. Uh, let's reread beginning in verse 7. It says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there found any more, neither was their place found any more in heaven. I'll be honest with you this morning, there, there's some things here I don't understand fully. I know this, that Satan has access to the presence of God today. We read that in the book of Job. And yet that we read here that there's coming a day that all that's going to be cut off. Satan today, he's roaming to and fro throughout the earth, isn't he? He's seeking those that he, whom he may devour. And he took a third part of the angels with him. We read about that earlier in this chapter. And, and, and they're part of that demonic force that is, is doing everything within their power to hinder the work of God here upon this earth. He's doing everything within his power to deceive people. He's doing everything within his power uh, to, to bring good people down. And yet we find this, that in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Look very carefully. Verse 10, I want to take our thought from verse 10 this morning. It says, I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, I want you to look at something that's said in verse 9. I know we're just sort of going back and forth real quick, but notice the names that are given to Satan here in verse 9. The first one we see is the great dragon. It says, the great dragon was cast out. The second one we see is that old serpent. I think that's a good description of Satan. He's that old serpent. He's that snake in the grass, isn't he? He's that one that just goes most of the time unnoticed and he does his work a lot of times behind the scenes, but at any time he's just looking to strike. But then he goes on and calls him the devil. And the fourth name that's given, that is used here is Satan. You ever looked up what those words mean? The word Satan, anybody know what that means? Adversary. 
What else? It literally means the word accuser. And you look that up, you, you'll see those two, those two words, adversary and accuser. They're in a, in, a, in a good Greek dictionary. But he said here that the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, it said he deceived the whole world. But then that there was a great rejoicing in verse 10. It said there was a loud voice in heaven. Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. This morning, with the, with the time we have left, I want to deal with that thought, the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. So Satan's the accuser. Who is he accusing? Well, he's accusing us. And I want you to notice these accusations, and you think about it, we, we've, we've heard all week about accusations. And again, I'll not give my opinion on any of that. But Satan's also an accuser. Satan is constantly making accusations against us, and I want to tell you this morning, some of them are true. Some of them are false. Remember, Satan's the father of lies. Satan's the deceiver. But a lot of times, he'll have just a little bit of falsehood mixed in with a lot of truth. And we need to be careful that we look at the whole picture. But he's accusing us today. See, he still has access. What we read about is that that's going to occur in the future. But today, that he is accusing us before our father. It says, Brother Joe Michael, day and night. He's busy. And he's accusing us. Now, flip back, if you would, to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. I want to deal with three sides of this accusation this morning. And I'll try not to deal just a lot, take a lot of time to deal with this part of it because I think we sort of understand this, this side of it. We've heard the preaching on this and maybe studied this before. And I can't tell you that I understand all of it, as I said earlier. But we read in 1 John in chapter 2, in verse 1, think about Satan accusing us before God day and night. He says in chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 John, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. That means he's the satisfaction, he's the expiation of our sins, for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. So John gives some insight here to what Satan's accusing us of. What's he dealing with here? He's dealing with sin, isn't he? You go back to chapter 1, that if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, he said we lie, do not the truth. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a child of God, you're not going to live a sinless life. You're going to fail. And yet that your sin does not, uh, it, it does not cause you to be removed as a child of God. It does not cause you to lose your salvation. It does affect your fellowship with the Father. And it's very important that we stay in fellowship with Him. That's essential in our lives. But as, as, as we confess our sins, that He forgives us our sins. But He says, my children, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. It's not God's desire that we sin, but we do sin. But He says this, that if any man sin, that we have an advocate with the Father. Why do we need an advocate? Why do we need one to... to to come to our defense, to come to our aid. God's not looking to strike us dead, is He? He's not looking to take away our salvation. He's not going to. He keeps our salvation. The reason we need an advocate is because of what we just read, that there's an accuser up there. And what does an accuser do? He lays out charges, doesn't he? So as we sin, that Satan is there and he's accusing us before God. And he's bringing up things night and day, how that we fail. And he's got his hands full with mine, because I do. I, I, and I don't brag about that. 
but I sin. And so I'm going to just use myself for an example. And I can just picture there before the throne of God that there's Satan and he comes up and he goes, did you see what Brent just, what he just did? Him supposed to be a preacher. You knew that thought that just went through his mind? Can't believe he did that. He knows better than that. He's read where that's, uh, that, that's sin against you and that, that's displeasing to you. Oh, he, he sure is sorry. He's got no business being your child. I'm glad I've got an advocate. I'm glad that Jesus Christ is there as our mediator, our intercessor, our great high priest. And all he has to do is say, you see those nail prints in my hands? That sin that Brent just committed, I paid for that a long, long time ago. And that's already been taken care of. But I just see Satan just have to hang his head, go away. And it's not that, as I said earlier, don't get the idea that God's sitting up there and, and see, he's not like the Judiciary Committee. And I'm glad he's not. I'm glad he's not listening to one side and say, well, that sounded pretty convincing. Listen to the other side, well, that sounded pretty convincing. He's not. But there's one, there's one up there that's charging, constantly accusing, night and day. Go, go back to the book of Romans, if you would. I said, I'm not going to take all our time to deal with this because I want to get to something else. Romans chapter 8. I had intended to turn over there, but I won't do it for time's sake, but... As you're turning to Romans chapter 8, there's a good example of this in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3, of the high priest of the nation of Israel at that time by the name of Joshua. And he's, you, you see there an example of him standing before God and Satan's there on, as, there on his right hand to accuse him and he's clothed with filthy garments. And what does God do? He forgives him by his grace and by his mercy and by the by what Christ would do, he would place upon him clean garments. And again, there would be no case. What I want you to see this morning is this. When Satan makes an accusation, Brother Allen, uh, a lot of he's telling the truth, isn't he? We've done exactly what he said we did. But we've got an advocate. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Paul said, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that's risen again, who is even at, our, at the right hand of God. I read this verse the other night. Making, who also maketh intercession for us. Why does he make intercession for us? Because there's an accuser there. It's accusing us night and day before God. But who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It won't stick, will it? Because that's already been paid for. It's already been taken care of. Let me mention something else to you this morning. Dealing with Satan and being our accuser. He's the accuser of the brother. So he accuses us before God. But the second thing that I want you to see this morning is he accuses us before ourselves. This may be something you never thought about before. But Satan accuses us before ourselves. What do you mean, preacher? How can he accuse us before ourselves? Do you believe Satan's able to put things in your mind? No, I don't believe that, preacher. I'm saved. Go read about Ananias and Sapphira. I believe they were saved. But Peter asked them the question, why has Satan put, the, put this in thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You see, Satan put something in their heart. And I believe as he did that to them, he can put things out in front of us. He can lure us. He can entice us. He can put things in our heart. And he can put thoughts in our minds and he can deceive us. Again, as I said, that he is the great deceiver. And I believe one thing that Satan does is he accuses the brethren 
If you're saved, you're, you're one of the brethren, as he accuses us, that he constantly brings up our sins, he brings up our failures, he brings up our past, he brings up our wrongdoings, he brings up our shortcomings. You ever experienced that? I have. I've experienced that. I tell you what, I, ex I experience it almost regularly. Because Satan, Satan does not, he does not want me to be in the ministry. And not that I'm some great preacher because I'm not. But he, he, he constantly puts things before me. Well, Branch, you just know why you could be a blessing to them. There's just no way you can help them. Because of what you did, what you do, or what you've done, or you failed here, you didn't do this that you knew you ought to do, or you did this, you knew you ought not to do that. And how can you, how, how dare you try to stand up and preach to them folks? Satan ever done that to you? Not to stand up and preach, but here you are claiming to be a child of God. You say, well, preacher, that's the Spirit convicting you. Go over to the, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If I can get this across. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Satan would like for you to get to the place to just throw up your hands and say, It's over. I quit. I have failed. I have missed a mark. I've gone too far. There's just no way that I can be used anymore in the service of God. And he will accuse you before yourself. But there's two different kinds of conviction that we experience as a child of God. I'm, I'm dealing with one of them. Let's deal with, with another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Listen to what Paul says in verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. The word repent there means to regret. Remember Paul already wrote him a letter. The first letter to the church at Corinth was tough for him to write. Because he had to deal with things that were uh, difficult to deal with. Things he didn't want to deal with with problems that were there. And he had to get very frank with them. So he said this, he said, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent or I do not regret, though I did re repent or regret. Evidently, Paul had a little bit of, and this is just his flesh, he was a human. Evidently, he had, after he sent this, he had some doubts, maybe the, the fact that he even went about it the right way, or should I, should I have even done this? Of course, he was led of God to do it. So he said, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. That's what Paul was trying to do, wasn't it? You see, the Word of God is convicting to us when, we're, when we've sinned. And so he says here that it had the desired effect. It was a mirror. It helped you see where you were. And then he said in verse 9, not in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. That's what I'm talking about. That's, what the, that's the work of the Holy Spirit among those that are saved. He convicts us of our sin. The Word of God shows us our sin so that we'll come to a place of repentance. But then when we come to that place and we confess our sins, by the way, He forgives us our sins. He doesn't hold that against us. He doesn't remember that anymore. Now, I'm not saying that does away with the consequences. We reap what we sow, but yet that sin, that, th 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 that's gone. So he said, you sorrowed to repentance, and that's a good thing. He said, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, you took it the right way. But look at verse 10. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Remember, salvation means deliverance. I don't, you, could, you could tie it to soul salvation here. I believe he's tying it more to d deliver it from those things that were wrong in your life. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But look at verse 10, the end of it. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Where does the sorrow of the world come from? The accuser of the brethren. You see the difference in the two? Probably the example that's on your mind is two men that denied the Lord. 
One was Simon Peter. When he denied the Lord, what did he do? He went out and he wept bitterly. And I'm going to make a prediction. You'd have to ask Peter about it when you see him one day, if you say. But I'm going to say, Brother Clay, that Satan had a heyday with him for the next three days. I bet you he accused him night and day to himself. Boy, you, <laughs> Simon Peter, look at you. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You confess that, 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 that Jesus was the Christ and that, 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 that you were the one that went up there on the Mount of Transfiguration and you were there when Jesus did all those miracles and look at what you've done. Boy, you blew it. What did the angel tell uh, was the women? I have to go back and look at it. I like how he put it. He said, go tell the apostles and Peter. I'm risen from the dead. In other words, I'm not done with you yet. What did Peter do? He came and he confessed that to the Lord. And what did Jesus say? He said, feed my sheep. Feed me. i got a work for you to do. He preached a wonderful message on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. Judas denied the Lord, didn't he? Judas Iscariot. And when he realized, when he saw what had happened, it said that he regretted that he had done it. And he took that money back and he cast it at their feet. And what did he go do? He went out and hung himself. Why? Because Satan put in his mind, it's over now. No hope for you. And he was lost. You see the difference? Do you realize, child of God, Satan will accuse you to yourself? Here's what you need to go back to. It's, it's just this simple. I want you to go back. And you take Satan back to the place where you confess that sin. That's all you got to do. You take him back to that place and that time where you acknowledge whatever it is that he's bringing up. You take him back there and say, no, right here is where I did what, the, what God said to do. And I admitted that I was guilty. And I confessed it. He forgave me of it. And so you just go on. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you just depart. Get out of here. Don't let Satan accuse you of that that you've already been forgiven for. I want to mention one more thing. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. As the accuser of the brethren, Satan will accuse others before us. Satan will accuse your brothers and sisters in Christ before you. Say, preacher, how do you know that? Go to verse 26 of Ephesians chapter 4. This is part of the work of Satan that we seldom recognize. We, we seldom really just see it. But we know that he's the author of confusion, isn't he? He hates God. He hates the church. He hates Christ. He hates unity. Oh, he hates unity. And because of that, he'll do anything within his power to stir up trouble, confusion, strife among God's people. He said in verse 26 of, of chapter 4, he said, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now there's two words that are used here and it's not the same word. The first word is angry. The second word is wrath. Which one is more severe? It's wrath, isn't it? Anger, when it's not dealt with, it turns into wrath, it turns into malice, it turns into bitterness. And so he said this, he said, be ye angry, but he said, don't sin. And then he said, don't let it go. You see, anger always has an object, doesn't it? You don't, you're not angry at nothing, you're angry at somebody. Somewhere, you say, well, I'm mad, at, I'm mad at something. No, you're mad at somebody. Trace it back far enough, there'll be an object to that, that anger. 
So he said, if you don't deal with that anger, if you allow that anger to fester, you allow, that, you, you allow the day to go by and you not get that fixed. He said, what it's going to do, it's going to turn into wrath. It's going to turn into malice. It's going to turn into bitterness. And notice what he said in the next verse. Neither give place to the, how did it, what did he call him here? The devil. What's devil mean? The accuser. He said, don't give place, don't give the accuser a chance. Because what's he, what he's going to do, if you fail to, to deal with that situation, if you fail to deal with that hostility, that anger you have towards someone, he said what's going to happen is it's going to fester and it's going to grow. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to accuse them before you. And before you know it, you're going to hate them. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, the same word, the same Greek word that's used here for devil is used here concerning, uh, it's a qualification of a deacon's wife. We don't, we don't have any deacon's wives here, but if you, if, if you were, I would make sure I would let you know I'm not calling you a devil. But what he's saying here, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers. Sober, faithful in all things. What's a slanderer do? Accuses. He would go on in the book of Titus in chapter 2, a similar statement. The aged women likewise, they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. It's the same word. Devil, slanderers, false accusers. Not false accusers. Not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. So he said here, when we allow anger towards someone to, to remain within us, he said we're giving place to the accuser. So preacher, what are you talking about? You ever got in your mind that somebody was upset with you because of something that they did, something they did or didn't do? Man. Brother Brent ain't called, he, he didn't call on me to pray the whole month of September. Oh, he must, he must be mad at me. He must not like me anymore. You know who's telling you that? The accuser. Or, you know, the other day when, when Brother Brent was preaching about, about lying, you know, he was just getting after it about how we need to be honest, we need to tell the truth. And he looked right at me when he said that. I just know he, he thinks I'm a liar. That's Satan. He's the accuser and he'll do anything within his power to get you. He'll, he'll accuse me of maybe something I didn't do. Listen, if, 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 if Brother Wade, if, if, if I did that to you, you need to come to me and say, look, did, did, did I wrong you? Do you know something I, that I don't know? Or, and somebody told me something because I'm afraid that when you preach that, you look right at me. I want to get it fixed. What does Satan do? Oh, no. Accuses, accuses, accuses. He's accuser of the brethren. And he'll accuse others before us. He'll put all kinds of things in our minds. And most of the time it's motives, isn't it? Oh, I know why. I know why he did that. I know why she did that. I know you don't. The Bible tells us we're not to judge motives. We'll leave that to him. In closing this morning, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to leave us with this thought. This, the, the, Paul's addressing the man in, from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that was committing fornication with his father's wife and he told him what to do. They were to withdraw fellowship from him and, and that they were to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And they had done this. And he said this, he, he, in verse 6, he said, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. You did what you were supposed to do. So that contrariwise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. 
evidently, Brother Allen, he had come and got things right with the church. And he said, uh, on the contrary, evidently they were, they, they were still treating him as, an, as, as one that was, uh, one that would have been uh, in, under church discipline. They said, no, you don't need to do that. You need to forgive him and comfort him. Lest one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. What's that talking about? That he would allow Satan to do exactly what I was talking about a while ago. Because, see, God can still use you. No matter what you've done, God can still use you. He may have to use you in a different way. Remember that, that clay? He may have to take it and make another vessel. He can still use you. He said, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. And he goes on down in verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. What devices is he talking about there? The accuser. We've got to forgive. We've got to move past these things because if we don't, that we'll allow Satan to accuse him in our eyes. This morning, he's an accuser. If you're here and lost, Satan, will, he'll make all sorts of accusations. He'll make accusations against saved people. The easiest thing to do if you're sitting here and lost this morning to know, well, I know I need to be saved, but, you know, I look around here and I know what this one does, I know what that one does, I know what the other one does. I know sin in their life, I know sin in that one's life. I don't like this about Brother Brent. That's Satan. He's an accuser. That's what he does. Don't listen to him. He's a liar. You say, well, a lot of what he's saying is true. But the reason why he's saying it is to keep you from, from trusting Christ. It's going to, and you're going to end up in hell if you listen to him. Or Satan will accuse you and he'll say, well, you've been too bad to be saved. You know, God, salvation is for good folks. No salvation is for sinners. But he's an accuser. Don't listen to him. We'll ask for a verse of a song this morning. I don't know.